What I want to start with is an extremely simple representation of some of the things that you have been talking about today and some of the ways in which you practice. So what we need to think about as a result of today is time, places, spaces, materials, and people. And for me, the real significance of play is what I put in the middle. Flow, fluidity, and flexibility. The reason why I'm trying desperately to hold on to these concepts is because in England, play has been drawn in to a policy-led agenda. And the narrative of planned and purposeful play is actually pulling play much more um, towards adult-led play and away from the kinds of free play, the very rich free play that we have been seeing this morning. You know how important interactions are, but I wanted to introduce you to the idea of interactions. Interactions comes from the work of Karen Barad and Halevi Lenz Taguchi, and they talk about the idea of assemblages, how humans and materials come together to interact with each other. The best way of explaining that is to go back to Monica's slide this morning, where she showed us the children with the ropes and the wood and the logs, the pulling and the pushing, the in, and how the material suggested things to the children and acted on the children in the same way that the children were acting on the materials. And that is where transformative spaces and transformative learning occurs. So think about those notions of not just the interactions, the relationships, the dialogues, the ideas, but also the interactions. So you might use this as a reflective tool. You might say, actually, in our setting, we give loads of time for children's free play. We don't interrupt them to take them indoors for their snack because the snack goes outdoors to them. We don't interrupt them to take them to school assembly or any of those things that we know from research puncture flow and spontaneity and what Pat Broadhead calls um, the time to build complexity into children's play. But you might say, OK, let's, ha let's have a look at the spaces as um, some of the presenters did this morning. So you can use this as a kind of schema to focus your attention on particular aspects of your practice. And as I said, it is an oversimplification. I think this is probably what um, things look like. And when I, re when I did this originally, I was thinking about Vygotsky, who all those years ago in the 1930s talked about children's learning as zigzagging all over the place. He didn't see learning as staged and hierarchical. But then when I was listening um, this morning, I thought this isn't just a representation of how children learn. This is probably a representation of what goes on inside your heads. <laughs> the messiness, the messiness that Sheila um, has been talking about this morning. So you can see there are already some nice connections coming up. Um, so I want to um, share with you some of the work and the ideas that I'm currently working with in my work with Helen Hedges in New Zealand, uh, with a team of people in Melbourne, and also at Sheffield University with my colleague, Dr. Liz Chesworth, who did her uh, PhD on children's interests and funds of knowledge. Now, funds of knowledge is a really important concept because it reminds us that children engage in many different cultural practices in their homes, communities, and in their preschool and school settings. Funds of knowledge are what children bring to your setting. The question is whether those funds of knowledge are accessed within the setting and whether they are valued. This links to the second concept of children's interests. We know that so many books, so many articles, so much guidance on early childhood education tell us that the, children, the curriculum should be based around children's interests. And it sounds so simple, um, but if you think about the previous slide, it is immensely complex. Um, Helen Hedges' work questions whether building a curriculum around children's interests means following every child's interests in the classroom or in the preschool setting, which would be virtually impossible. She talks about community interests and community participation. 
And I think we saw an example of that with Monica's work this morning, when as a community, the children were coming together around those materials and creating interests in pushing and pulling and tying knots and seeing what would happen if. Helen Hedges also talks about the importance of interests being linked to children's real questions and children's deep inquiries. And her work shows us that sometimes interests may come and go. They may be quite fleeting, but sometimes interests are deep and sustained and they build over time. Children's working theories, again, these link to funds of knowledge, children's interests. Children's working theories are the ways in which they link their everyday intuitive knowledge with what we might call the more scientific knowledge or the subject knowledge that we have in our curriculum. And in Ashta, that is centered around um, the curriculum goals that you all work with. Now, working theories can be quite eclectic. I'm currently writing a paper with one of my students, and in her work, she was looking at children's interests in working the and working theories. She had a class of six and seven-year-old children in an international school. And the children played a theme for a whole term called Dead Forever, when they were deeply interested in existential matters of life, death, and dying. Now, it may seem very strange, and it may actually seem extremely discomforting. And when Michelle has presented her work, she has become known as the lady who does death and dying. Um, <laughs> it's a bit... Um, Anyway, it's beautiful, beautifully, beautifully crafted work. But an example of how eclectic working theories are is um, a conversation that Michelle recorded amongst her children was about death and dying and whether you could come back to life. Some of the children had seen the clip of the footballer who dropped dead or appeared to drop dead on the football field because his, he had a, um, a heart attack. He was brought back to life because they had all the medical equipment there. So the children were going between, well, can you come back to life? Well, of course you can, because he did. He was dead, and he came back to life. And another child said, yes, you can come back to life. Zombies come back to life. <laughs> so you see this lovely, curious mix of the imagined, the imaginary, the factual, that they haven't quite got all of the facts together. But in even so, working theories tell you a lot about children's interests and inquiries, and it also gives you some clues as to where you come in and where you might actually do some retuning, some discussions, stimulate their inquiries, um, and bring in that scientific or more uh, subject oriented knowledge. Okay, I'm just wondering how many of you are familiar with these ideas already, not if you are. Yes? Yeah, a few, a few people. Okay, that's good. And then where these ideas come together in a project I'm currently doing in, um, with colleagues in Melbourne is around the idea of converged play. Now, um, probably many people in this room, and I know I have done this in the past, might be a little sceptical about children's interests that are linked to popular culture. But the use of um, digital technologies in children's everyday lives is really challenging that idea of popular culture being somehow lesser in terms of children's interests and working theories. So in our project, we have been documenting children who are working with ideas about Frozen and Minions and monster trucks and all of the things that we might kind of think, they get enough of that at home, we don't need to do that in the preschool. But the children are doing some really interesting things in their converged play. So we've documented groups of children pay, playing minions in the playground, um, obviously watching the minions films. On their tablets, they are doing um, minions games. And in one episode, the children used, um, used a, an iPad to go into the playground, and they actually filmed their friends playing minions and loaded the film up um, onto the, the school's website to show what they were doing in the preschool. So I think the research is telling us that children's use of digital technologies 
is actually running in advance sometimes of adults' knowledge and understanding of the potential of those digital technologies. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but I do think we need to start to take converged play very seriously indeed as part of this very rich repertoire of what children bring to the setting and what children can do in the setting. So here is my provocation, and here's the bit where Monica might want to put her hands over her ears. What about, what about, and I lose parts, natural materials, this is always where I have come from. What about if these digital technologies, movable, wearable, whatever, what if these were seen as loose parts? What if these were seen as a tool that could be taken in, around, through, amongst what children are doing to add new layers of complexity to their play? And Monica has not fainted. So <laughs> she's all right. She's fine. So that is a what if provocation to you. And again, um, this, is, this, this has emerged from, from the the project in Melbourne, and also reading contemporary literature on this topic as well. So the picture of summer really brings together, the little girl is summer, the picture of summer really brings together these ideas because um, summer's family practice involves going fishing and has done for very many years. She knows how to prepare the boat, how to prepare the bait and the rods and the lines. She knows how to catch, kill, gut and clean a fish, yes, <laughs> um, and she is also uh, very interested in um, then going home and helping to prepare the fish to cook for the family meal. Now, it isn't just the fishing. Summer's interests and working theories are much wider than that because they embrace a, knowledge, a deep knowledge and a deep love of the natural world and continuous inquiries about the natural world. So what I'm saying is it's not just the activity, it's what underlies the activity in terms of children's interests, their deep inquiries, and their working theories. Okay, so think about that. So what is going on here? What does this all mean? So I mentioned Liz Chesworth's work, and again, she considers children's mutually constituted funds of knowledge. So what children bring individually to the setting become shared funds of knowledge as they co-construct meaning in their play. She gives the example of Craig, detailed knowledge of cars from his home community, his home setting. What he does in the nursery setting is building a go-kart. And similarly, Ellie does a lot of baking and cooking at home. And you can see all of the practices that go around the baking and cooking because she prepares party food and she welcomes the guests to her party. So it's not just understanding what funds of knowledge children are bringing, it's also understanding the connections and how they build new repertoires within the community of practices that you create in your settings. Okay. So I've encouraged you to think about scale, space and context. Sometimes what children are doing in the setting, in the indoor part of the setting, can actually be replicated in terms of what they do outdoors. The difference is in the scale of the, the, um, the materials and the resources that they might use and the different types of affordances. So if you look at this picture here, you could have one child building with um, those cards but if you look at the other picture, the same cards are on a much bigger scale and they require several people to connect and build them and keep them stable. So think about the affordances of the resources and the materials that you are creating or that you are buying for your setting and how you can get the best value from those resources in terms of where they're used and also how they're used. So you can have very similar materials but quite different affordances. I love this quote from Thomas Hendricks. He is a philosopher of play, and his phrase about um, play being understood as one of the special places for the conjuring of possibility is a phrase that I come back to a lot. 
and especially when I, I'm seeing these more limiting and limited ways of understanding play um, back in the early years foundation stage in England. The conjuring of possibilities is what we saw in the presentations this morning because the spaces were created for the children, the resources were there for them, they had the time, and most importantly, they had the trust and the confidence of practitioners who were very enabling of those types of activities. And um, again, we've got an image of something that can be done indoors and something that can be done outdoors on a much bigger scale. And again, um, this happens to be summer, going into a very large construction that was made on a beach in New Zealand. And immediately, I, ha I had my health and safety hat on because things might have fallen off and knocked her on her head. Um, but somehow this has been built, this structure has been built, and it was continuously made and remade as the weeks went by. And then um, a high tide just washed it all away. But the conjuring of possibility was there continuously for people to contribute to. Deb Moore at Deakin University, in, again in Melbourne, has done some lovely work on children's secret places, cubbies and dens. And I think we all know the value of this. But what Deb's research shows us is that children do not actually need a physical space. Sometimes it was a drain in the playground that was their secret space or a meeting place for those people who were in the know, or it might have been a safe space where you could go um, because you were in a chasing game and you just wanted some time out. So Deb, Deb's work shows us the, the value not just of the physical spaces where children can be secret or quiet, <coughs> um, but also the virtual spaces that they create. The important thing that Deb writes about is that these secret spaces are secret from the adults. So that everything that they do is not always scrutinized and it is not always knowable by you. So it is lovely to see dens and um, constructions and houses and, um, and tents, but it's also important to know that the children might be using those spaces in ways that they don't want you to know about. So children's secret spaces are also about their agency in the space. It's making that space theirs. It's also about creating spaces that are not known, always known, and scrutinized by adults. So have a think about that in terms of this idea of the space being a material, a real, an actual space, and spaces created that um, are virtual and really, really secret. And when um, Deb writes about when the children were talking to her, about their secret spaces, and they said that they would tell her where the secret spaces were and what they were for, but Deb wasn't to tell the teacher. <laughs> so interesting, research ethics are always interesting. Okay, so <coughs> these, this for me is the absolute core of, of the importance of free play and why I will, um, why I will support free play against the over-interpretation of adults' plans and adults' purposes. Play is about freedom, agency, and control. And I know that freedom always takes place within um, certain rules and certain constraints. Um, but play gives children the liberation from situational constraints. So if you think about that lovely big um, the reel that we saw in the nursery this morning, all the different ways that children were using that, all the, the different ways in which they were using the ladder. The ladder becomes a train. The ladder also becomes a way of getting perhaps to the roof of the, of the house. So m materials can do many, many different things. And play also gives children this, this conjuring of possibility as the potential for gaining mastery over, within, and within material and virtual worlds. And I've come back to this idea of one of these being a loose part. If you know David Hockney's work, you know that he took to the iPad um, with immense enthusiasm, went off into the Yorkshire Wolds, and did some stunning and really, really amazing paintings. And inevitably, this exhibition has been all over the world. But this, for David Hockney, did become a loose part, something that he could take into the environment, 
It became part of his multimodal, sensory, embodied experience of that natural environment and how he chooses to represent it. So again, think about this potential for combining traditional and digital play and what new affordances might come into that space. The concept of multimodality um, is really important for children, not just children in preschool. I think it's important for us right across our lifespan. And again, I'm in, if I look at the context in England, we see the idea of literacy being reduced to reading, writing, speaking and listening. Not only do children, young children in reception classes do quite extended periods of time on phonics, but they also do an awful lot of spag. Who knows what spag is, apart from the, who I explained it to Christina this morning. Oh, you are blissfully unaware of this concept. Spag is spelling and grammar. Okay? So the countervailing argument is that children experience um, their world in multimodal ways, and we've seen that through the presentations this morning, some of the slides that I've used with you today. Multimodality is important because it means that children can make choices from a range of many different materials in terms of how they represent their knowledge and their experiences. So to reduce literacy to technical processes is is a reductive way of understanding children's multimodal <coughs> engagement with the world and the importance of multimodality in terms of supporting um, their learning. Multimodality gives different modes of representation and meaning making. This again links to the idea of collaborative inquiry, deep interests and real questions. It does not mean that children's, that we just set up activities or allow children to set up their own activities and that we don't engage with the substantive content of their thinking. The emphasis on play is sometimes go too far in the opposite direction when we fail to engage with, so what is it that children are learning? And we know again from numerous research projects that children's self-initiated play activities with rich and, and varied materials does connect them with areas of literacy, numeracy, with knowledge and understanding of the world, with spatiality. The research shows us that play creates those really important dispositions for learning that are lifelong. And the idea of choices and agency and this important understanding of not just the interaction, but the intraaction means that children can then understand the transformative effects that they have on materials and the transformative effects that the materials have on them. So again, um, the children in the classroom, uh, the outdoor setting at the top, in the top picture, had taken Romas out into their playground. This was a classroom rich with digital technologies. It was part of children's choices, it was part of their repertoires. And the children are mapping their playground. And again, if you think of the space, this is a reception class in England, if you think of the idea of space, going out into the space <coughs> gave them different choices because they wanted to know how big is our playground? Well, how do you, me how do you measure it? How can we make a plan of the playground? So their real questions and their deep inquiries led to the use of different tools, different materials that had different affordances for the inquiries that they wanted to follow. Okay. So um, I'm just going to return to the question that Sinead posed us, for us this morning, um, where we touched on this idea of readiness and that early childhood education is a stage in its own right. Well, yes, I do agree with that, but I think it's also really important that we engage with these discourses of how what early childhood education is doing for children and with children and families that does take them to um, the, next, the next areas of learning. I was going to say the next level, but I try not to think in levels. So who knows whether this child 
doing his lovely picture on the community, will become an artist. This is actually this witch lives in Fitzroy in Melbourne, and she's just had an upgrade. Um, they've just repainted her. She's very beautiful. So who knows where our play lives take us? I um, read the autobiography of Joe Simpson not so long ago, who is a very famous climber. And if any of you know about Joe Simpson, you'll know that he has taken a lot of risks in his climbing career. He writes about his childhood in his autobiography. He grew up um, as a young child in Africa. And he writes about um, getting on his bike, wanting to go out into the bush, um, away from the home and family, having adventures. And he writes about having to go to hospital one week because he'd, he'd cut his head quite badly. But his sister dares him to ride his bike down some steps. So he accepts the dare, rides the bike down some steps, comes off the bike, opens the cut, goes back to hospital. But that seemed to have been an everyday, risk-taking seemed to have been an everyday part of his childhood, his adolescence, and then his career <coughs> as a climber. So I just wonder, or I, I will ask you to wonder, where your play life has brought you to. So when I was a child, I'm afraid to say I was extremely bossy, and I <laughs> lined up all my various teddy bears um, and I was always teaching them and look where we are now I've got you lined up <laughs> and here am I so so just do some backtracking it's very difficult to prove what play leads to and I think that that gives us some real difficulties in early childhood we can't give the politicians and the policy makers those simplistic answers but what we can do is think about our past play lives and how our play lives have brought us to who we are now and, and also what we do. Um, it also struck me that the picture of the boy um, drawing his picture is so dated. Nobody works on computers like this anymore. You know, children will be out there with a tablet, with an iPad, doing things where they want to do and how they want to do it. So how quickly the, te the technology moves on. And we know that children are doing so many things with technologies. They're even making their own films. They're uploading them onto their YouTube channels. How many people here have got their own YouTube channels? OK, I know children under the age of 10 who've got their own YouTube channels. So you know, I think we need to get with the program a little bit more. Right. So, again, I want to give you something to think about, something that you can take away. If you know my work through my podcast for Ashta, or if you know my books, I really strongly support the idea of integrated pedagogical approaches. Sometimes when I hear people say, oh, play is the way in which children learn, that's okay. I would say play is one of many ways in which children learn. Integrated pedagogical approaches for me means child-initiated and sometimes adult-led play is not a binary. It needs to be seen as a continuum, but a continuum where there is continual responsiveness between the adults and the children. So you know all these things about observing and interacting, responding to their interests, listening out for those working theories, understanding where you tune your interactions, um, understanding how you ask good questions of children to lead their inquiries, thinking about where you do enrich their activities with some subject knowledge. And it might be their knowledge and understanding of the world. It might be um, uh, facts about space or facts about cooking or whatever it is that's interesting them. You know that um, we need to assess learning and progress and to review our planning on the basis of, of our assessments on our ways of understanding children's learning. The reason I've put school readiness, performance and accountability in red is as a kind of warning that we do not allow those discourses to overpower and dominate our ways of thinking in early childhood education. It is important that we speak to those discourses, but that we find our own language of speaking to those discourses. And similarly, 
It's important to have discussions about children's play, their choices, their dispositions and learning, but I do think we need to pay attention to the goals and the outcomes, whether it's within ASHTA or within other curriculum frameworks. The difference for me is whether we allow those goals and outcomes to dominate everything we do in the setting and we use those as our lens rather than looking at the children, their activities, those interactions, those interactions, and develop the learning goals and outcomes around, around those. So those are, those are my two warning areas, if you like. And finally, I would like you to go back and think about what images and metaphors you use to describe um, your own learning, because Sheila's talked this morning about your own learning as individuals, your own learning as communities of practice, and to think about what images and metaphors you might use to describe that. So for me, um, the, the, the images that I've chosen, sometimes I think children literally fizz with the excitement of learning and doing and thinking and trying out and creating problems and solving problems. And I like the idea of you know, a, a, a firework exploding and going into all sorts of different directions and not quite knowing what's going to happen, but your skill as an educator is putting some shape and some substance around that. I also chose the other image because what we have to remember is that children are constantly being and becoming. And we know that other B word, belonging, is really important for children as well. So they're constantly making themselves, making their identities, finding out not just who they are in the world, but also what they can do. And I've written quite a lot about that can-do orientation towards learning. On the other side, this is my health warning. The images we have increasingly in policy frameworks are about steps, stages, and hierarchies. But learning is organized as if it takes place in linear ways as if teaching one thing will inevitably lead you on to being able to teach something else, that children will learn in these very ordered and neat ways. We know that that is not how it happens. What, we, what good practitioners see over time is patterns, progression, um, continuity, and the, that spiraling, that growth of children's knowledge, skills, and understanding but it does not take place in this neat and linear way that is represented in um, some policy documents and certainly in the early years foundation stage. Um, my other health warning is um, education is not an input-output model. And again, there are some very simplistic assumptions around in policy frameworks that if you do one thing, if you pull this lever, then something will happen. And what um, the word that I keep coming back to um, in my own thinking, in my writing, and in my own practice is this idea of complexity. Okay? So I am leaving you with what I hope are two very positive image, images of children's learning, but also two health warnings in terms of um, how Ashta develops and has been developing over time in Ireland, I think is very similar to how Tifariki has been developing in New Zealand. It's been organic. You've had stability in terms of leadership. It's been generative, a lot of consultation with the community, and you have helped to build those concepts and, the idea, and those ideas. It is not perfect. No policy is ever going to be perfect. But my last, my last thought with you um, is not to be pulled in the direction of steps, stages, and hierarchies and certainly not an input and output model. Play does not fit anywhere near those kinds of models because it is messy, but it is exciting, and it is immensely complex. So I know it's been a long time till lunch. <laughs> um, I am around for the rest of the day. Please come and talk to me um, if there are any questions you would like to ask, and thank you for listening.